17. Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. We are only 17 Patreon members away from our next major milestone. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Cinco's or a jackhammer chatterbait, you all get to help keep the show alive and well. All Patreon members will receive 20% off their orders to shallow water fishing tackle, 5% off all their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 10% off their orders to Tiger Crankbaits, 10% off to Catoctin Creek Rods. You'll gain access to our members only private Facebook group, members only content, and of course, our weekly and monthly giveaways. Again, we are only 17 members, 17 members away from hitting another major milestone. Thank you all so much. If it wasn't for you, this channel couldn't keep going. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia, and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits, online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and we're going back to VKAE. Their first tournament is in the books, and I'm here with Jonathan uh, Goyana. If I said that right, Goyana. Um, he absolutely smoked it this year, his first win, and we're going to get into basically his life and his fishing because, yeah, this is just his first win of the year. He is no stranger to the winner's circle and to snakeheads in general. So, John, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Thomas. So, I mean, yeah, let, let's kind of start from the beginning. Like, how did you get into kayak fishing and then eventually into, like, snakeheads? Um, well, I've been fishing pretty much all my life. Uh, but I never thought about kayak fishing until I heard about snakehead being in, you know, the Potomac. Um, and I wanted to target them, so I'd bank fish for them with zero luck. And uh, a buddy of mine, we talked about getting kayaks, you know, to try and target them. And so so I picked up one from Walmart, and uh, that's how I got started with a 10-foot lifetime and uh, just, you know, regular spinning gear. So, like, the basic of the basic. Um, someone was said, hey, try frogs. I had no idea how to work a frog, but, you know, bought a few anyway. And uh, that's kind of how we just got started. And took a few trips before I found my first snakehead, but once I found him, and I was hooked. What year was that, roughly? I believe that was uh, 2016 or 2017. Okay, yeah, that th dude, wow, you've been doing this a long time then. Wow. <laughs> like... First it was... Uh, yeah, because chasing snakes, yeah. like, that hasn't been... Like, I mean, compared to, like, bass fishing, if people don't know, like, the snakehead world... It isn't 20 or 30 years old in the Virginia, Maryland area. So would you say like you're one of like the first wave of people to be like, hey, this is pretty cool? I feel like, well, I feel like there was a, a, a wave before me um, that kind of fell off. Um, but kind of I'm, I'm in that wave with uh, there's a guy named Stephen Camboris who posts a lot of snakehead videos and really helped to like bring out, you know, bring the attention to snakehead um, with him and like a, a few other, a uh, few other YouTubers that, you know, started putting out content about snakehead. Um, I feel like I'm part of that wave of folks uh, like mid uh, 2010s, late 2010s. Um, and yeah, and we've all kind of been fishing around the same time and kind of all learned together. What area of uh, Virginia, Maryland are you in? Um, I'm down in Spotsylvania. So I primarily fish uh, Rappahannock and Potomac. Has that area always been, like Odenkirk has been on the show numerous times talking and hyping up the, the Rappahannock snakehead fishing. Has it always been that way or is it slowly becoming, sort of speak, the the premier darling for snakehead in Virginia? I want to say it started with the Potomac. Um, for me, the rap was never, the Rappahannock was never prevalent with snakeheads until probably about 2019. Um, uh, before that, you know, I, I primarily fish the Potomac for quantity and quality. Um, and I, you know, folks would find them in the Rappahannock here and there, but never, 
you know, in large numbers and never, you know, the dragon size class, which is 30 inches or larger. Um, yeah, I think the first one I caught was probably around 2018 on the Rappahannock and it was like a 26 incher, which was, you know, a good size for the time. Yeah. Um, but now, I mean, we're finding them, you know, well in the thirties without, without issue. What, what's your PB? Uh, 35 and a half inches. Oh, damn. Uh, yeah. It, it, and that was a while ago too. Really? Yeah, that was in 2021. Um, this year I caught a 35, um, but yeah, still waiting to catch that 36 or larger. For people that don't know the culture, what size is considered a dragon? So uh, there are two thoughts. Uh, one is the 10 pound mark uh, for those that use scales. And then the other that use you know, bump boards is 30 inches. Uh, folks that, you know, get one that's over 30 inches and over 10 pounds, they call that a double dragon. You know, just, it's just a you know, nomenclature we use within our own groups. But um, there was another term that was thrown around for a little bit, you know, for a really large snakehead would be a chanaconda. Since it's, uh, they're called the chana argus is their scientific name. So that's, that's another term that hasn't really stuck yet, but it's one of my favorites it, out there. Again, it's like, for all the people in the government, they're like their thoughts on it. The branding for this creature is so freaking cool. I mean, the they're they fight hard. They they look cool. My wife even saw a picture of was like that should be like a rod wrap or a skin for something. It just looks really cool. The color pattern and then a dragon is the sot the kicker like the big trophy. It's like that's freaking. You can't pay for better branding. Like it's so crazy, the cult that formed around this really unique fish. Agreed. And, you know, that's that's one of the reasons I continue to go after them. It's because, you know, I've, I'm really familiar with them. I've, I've learned a lot about them and it's not something I want to give up. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I've just I put in the time and I, I, I've figured out the knowledge. Did you see like a big influx of snakehead specific anglers really with the COVID post COVID era? Like what how, did that change at all? Snakehead fishing? It really did. It, I, I believe it did. Um, for a little bit, I, I, I kind of quit, not quit, but I slowed down on my snakehead fishing during COVID because all of my spots were just blown up. Um, not to say that, you know, they're my spots. They're all public waters, but anywhere I'd go where I used to catch quality fish started, um, I just found that, you know, the, the quality wasn't there. The, the numbers weren't there. That's because everyone was, you know, catching them and taking them home to eat, which is perfectly fine. Um, but for those days that I want to go out and just catch, you know, five to ten fish in a few hours, they weren't as plentiful. Um, but now, I mean, now I'm starting to – we've had days my buddies and I go out and we're catching like 20, 30 of them, you know, in one session. And it's just fantastic. Why do you think that is? Why do you think it bounced back? I don't know that it really bounced back or that we're able to figure out the patterns better now. Because um, we just, well, me personally, I've you know, been able to kind of gather that experience of knowing what time, what time of the year they'll be where, uh, under what conditions. Um, there's no true formula yet because I'm still, you know, I'll still skunk, you know, on trips, but I'm starting to get a better idea of, of where they're at um, and where to find them. Interesting. Yeah, because I've always been wondering about that. Like, the one argument online that people have is is about bow fishermen decimating their populations. And, and to me, what's interesting about that, that, that hypothesis is, will anglers and bow fishermen truly want to decimate their population? Because that's their cash crop. Like, if it disappeared they would lose money. And I feel like eventually that's the that's the next threshold we hit is the population will start to shrink. And then anglers that like to keep them and bow fishermen will be like, wait a minute, we need to start husbanding this thing ourselves because if we if they disappear, we no longer have our, you know, our cash crop, so to speak. And I, I don't know. I still think at some point that's gonna happen because they're just so popular. And it's funny 
in in my circles because you have the blue head the, the the blue catfish that's an invasive and you have the snakehead but there's a complete different trajectory on what they do to the ecosystem and their popularity i believe it's just it's fascinating to see both introduced kind of at the same time but two different trajectories basically right i agree um I'm sort of in the camp that thinks the blue cats have done a lot more damage. Mm -hmm. um, of course, they've been around a lot longer, so we've been able to tell you know, what they've done. Um, and then there are those other camps that say, hey, yeah, they're here to, you know, they have done the damage, but they're here to stay, so just let them thrive because, they, you know, they go for those trophy catfish that are, you know, 60, 70 pounds, you know, the ones in the James. You know, those aren't blues, but, you know, they catch those huge monsters down there, hundred pound fish, you know, and that's the kind of uh, I think fishery that some of these trophy fish, you know, trophy anglers are looking for in the Potomac as well. No, I, I do. I a hundred percent agree on that. So, really, with with all that said, um, this kind of gets us into like the tournament side of things. Honestly, H how did you find going from a, a Walmart sort of speak kayak and and trying it out in two thousand sixteen to, you know you being in the winner's circle, like how did you make that, that jump? Um, I don't really recall what the first instance was, I believe. So, so, uh, there's a group called the Legion of Anglers. Um, they're just, they're, um, a Legion of Anglers, exactly the name, but, uh, they're, they're a club and they partnered with KBF with Chad. Uh, kayak bass fishing uh, to host a series for snakehead and um, that was in 2021 and that's when i started i was like I was like oh yeah i've always been interested in in tournament fishing um never knew really how to do it so you know read the rules i was like okay i think i can do this and uh pretty much the first few events i were, was able to grab first place um, actually it wasn't just with the Legion of Anglers and KBF. There was another group called, uh, Delaware Paddle Sports that hosted, uh, the Medusa tournament. And this was, uh, in June, 2021. Um, so, so in that month I took home a month, the monthly tournament, um, got first place in that, got first place. That's where the KBF one took first place for, uh, the Delaware Paddle Sports Medusa tournament, which was the monthly and then um, there was a single day tournament, which was called the Five State Battle, hosted by Legion of Anglers, and uh, I took that one as well. First place for that one. And then you also have a tournament coming up this weekend, correct? Right, I do have one. Uh, Legion of Anglers is holding one um, in I don't know how to pronounce it, Joppa Town, Hope Town. Oh, Chop Tank, I think is what um, they call it. Kind of. I don't know. It's on the Gunpowder River, okay. um, uh, Mariner Point Park. Not familiar. It's north of Baltimore. I not familiar with that area at all. Fished it once. Hmm. Um, not not gunpowder, but uh, at APG. Um, but yeah, hopefully, uh, <laughs> hopefully I can find fish because it, I'm, it, I'm totally out of my element when it comes to uh, you know. Well, the waters further. You say you're out of your element, but you just did say that you've had pretty consistent success when you've gotten into tournament fishing just from the beginning and. And honestly, there are a lot of people that that don't have that success right away. They have to grind and do things. What, without having to give away like all of your sauce, like what do you think set you apart? Like why was it you were able to hop into the ring initially and and basically punch with everybody else? Um, I'd say for that first tournament, um, you know, the single day tournament. I was, you know, it's one of those uh, tournaments where you can fish any public waters. And I was fishing one of my honey holes, right, you know, that I always fish. I mean, it's public waters, but it's a place that's like near and dear to my heart because my buddies and I, we, we, we scouted, you know, we, we drove around, we walked through woods, we tried to figure out how to get to, you know, certain waters. Um, so we were able to find a spot and, you know, that's kind of where we cut our teeth. And so when that first tournament came around and said, hey, any public waters, I was like, okay, well, I'll go to my regular spot. We'll see how I do. And instead of just pulling, you know, my regular, you know, fish in the 20s, 
that day I was just pulling in 30, you know, 30 inch fish. And it was just, it just was magical. Like it just it clicked. Know, happened to yeah. me that day. Yeah. And, um, and you know, that's kind of how that started. But then, you know, I realized I can't just continue to fish the exact same waters over and over again. Cause, um, snakehead they move around throughout the season and you know as you know you know you fish the potomac as well it, it, the hydrilla comes in super yeah. thick so you don't have the same access to spots that you would like in may as you would in august um and so you know we had to you know i had to learn and branch out and figure out where to go uh, you know to find them if you had to pick between subaquatic vegetation grass or spatter dock lily pads which one would you prefer to hunt them in i guess it depends on the condition mm. but uh, generally in the grass um you know if it's crazy sunny out uh, i've noticed they they prefer to stay under the spatter dock um, under lilies and stuff like that but if it's you know if it's cloudy i i love just running frogs across the mat and not having to deal with you know fishing it through yeah. spatter dock stuff like that and to me those those hits are you know top water hits are always so much fun i was um i was crashing a swim jig this was i think three or four weekends ago when i was fishing for Ant with antietam and i was throwing a i think it was a full ounce swim jig on a high tide through the spatter dock just punching it through and stuff and i I know I smoked a couple of snakes that that got came off, broke my hook. But when they hit in that spatter dock, Jesus, like it's I don't know how the hell you land them. Like even I had 50 pound braid and it was still a problem because of how quickly they can wrap you up and all that crap. It's just a matter of keeping the pressure on and, you know, just keeping it on as hard as you can for, you know, as best you can and just not panicking, you know, once they start digging, just keeping that pressure on, pulling them through the grass, pulling them through the spatter dock, whatever you're working in. Uh, that's what works for me. Um, I'm not sure how other folks do it. I mean, of course, you've got to have the heavy gear. You know, you said you had the you know, heavy braid. Um, I use heavy or extra heavy rods. Uh, so, you know, I can just if, if they start digging, I'll just sit there and lay into them until I start feeling some movement and just start, you know, continue to wrench them up. Um, I ruin a lot of equipment that way, but that's that's what works for me. Oh man, I tr I feel you there with ruining equipment with those suckers. Um, with, with just to, to stay on the spatter dock before we move on, do you fish it generally speaking like a bass where you're just you're hitting the edges and just the obvious points and guts in in the spatter dock, or are you like so many Instagram photos I see just in the middle of just a pad field with no rhyme or reason, just closing your eyes and just chucking it? Oh yeah, I'm both. <laughs> um, usually when I come up to, you know, like when you come up to one, you do the standard routine of taking something, you know, subsurf and just running across the edges uh, before you even, you know, make it up there to make sure that you haven't ruined those waters. Well, at least this is my mindset. You know, I, I fish it as I'm coming up. And then once I'm at the edge, uh, you know, I'll throw right into the meat of it um, and just work my stuff that way. Uh, you know, if there are holes, I'll, I'll, I'll target those as well. But, I mean, I've found quality fish in the middle, you know, just in the middle of spatter dock, especially if they're up in the air and they're really providing a lot of cover and high tide hasn't covered them. Uh, you, know, you just really have to work, work your frogs or whatever you're working with, you know, through the stuff and just hopefully you, know, you can get it to cut, you know, cut the spatter dock. If you do get, you know, bit. Do, the, do they get, so in the bass fishing realm, you got to be careful when you're dealing with lily pads or spatter dock because if you if you hit one with your trolling motor or, or 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 anything like that, it's like a spider web where it'll just create the whole pad field to explode because they get nervous. Um, how do you approach getting into the spatter dock field without? Is it just don't cause too much of a commotion? I guess it depends on. I guess it depends because if it's just a small patch. You know, of course, you'd want to go in pretty gingerly, but some of the places I fish, it's just 
like a huge, huge patch. So, you know, you just, I fished before I, you know, work my way in. Um, some, generally, I won't use my motor to push in, you know, okay. while I'm already in there, uh, I'll paddle around. Um, but there'll be times where, you know, I'll hear a pop way off in the distance and I'm like, okay, I know there's a fish there. I know it's hungry and I'll you know, turn my motor on and just, you know, run it through. And, uh, wow. yeah, I don't know. It doesn't, most of the time it'll, you know, scare the fish off, but snakehead, I mean, I've always known, known them to come back. Hmm. Um, if they're hungry, they'll come back. That's so cool, dude. That's really cool. So, I mean, we, we covered like grass, we covered pads. Um, and we also covered this off air, I think where I've watched some YouTube stuff about in Japan where they're fishing clear water docks and things like that. Have you had a chance to fish different types of cover or is it predominantly just like pads and grass in Virginia and Maryland? You know, my first experience in something new was, uh, the Legion of Anglers held, held their first tournament um, at Blackwater. And that's the first time I've ever fished reeds for snakehead. Hmm. And I couldn't figure it out. So that, that was one experience that I'd kind of like to get back into because I could, I could hear them going crazy and I just couldn't figure out how to get to them, you know, other than uh, pitching a jig and just hoping I'm, I'm finding the right hole. Um, but, you know, I could hear them like 20 yards off, like, way out into the reeds i'm like i have no idea how to fish this because we just don't have that where i'm at down mm-hmm. here um but as far as clear water um i do love when i'm in an area and it, it's clean and i can sight fish um that's one of the uh you know one of my favorite ways to catch them uh, i feel it's kind of like hunting because yeah. you can see That'd be so cool. Depending on the situation, like if there's grass and then there's, you know, it's a higher tide and you can see just their fins kind of moving in the water. Um, and you're, just, you're like, I'm hoping this isn't carp and you just start throwing to them and, and you know, getting them to bite that way. Uh, that's always pretty rewarding. Um, but, you know, and then there's cases like on the Rappahannock where it's not clear, but they're in deeper water and you just have to, you know, fish them subsurface wise for that that's interesting yeah it's such a fascinating culture that i, I really really enjoy just learning more and more about um yeah, but but again like i digress because you had a big tournament here um go, going into this first event just just for people that don't know the the club uh vkae like where was the tournament held and what's type the format because I, I i think people at home are probably going to assume it's like bass fishing right it's like your best five like how, how does it work it's similar. It's, it uh, so VK follows uh, similar rules to KBF. They're a KBF affiliate. Um, so um, it's really, or it's actually the best three because uh, when I guess when I first started fishing, it wasn't it wasn't very common to catch five you know five fish in an outing. So you know, uh, Legion of Anglers started with you know your best three, which we adopted as well um, at VKE. And so with this past event at Aquia, uh, it was at Willow's Landing. Um, and it's, it starts, it's from six in the morning till, um, three in the afternoon. It's a little bit different from, um, like, uh, you know, KBF events because generally, well, at least the ones that I fish aren't single launch events. Uh, in the snakehead world, we've had, you know, you know, a lot of the, the derbies and smaller tournaments that people have held, there have been a lot of folks that um, have experienced, you know, cheaters, you know, people that might may have fished uh, private waters or, um, you know, or may have, you know, shared fish with other folks uh, that aren't, in, you know, that or got fish from folks that weren't in the tournament. So, um, you know, we make this, or VKE has it, so it's a single launch um situation everybody launched out of willow's landing um at check-ins at 4 30 once you check in you're able to uh go off and go find your spot uh, fishing starts at six o'clock lines in at six o'clock and then you fish till three o'clock and then everybody comes back has to has to recover back at the same launch and then uh, we have the award ceremony right then and there that's really cool. That's really cool. So so going into the event, did you have a chance to practice? Like what were your thoughts 
going into it? Um, I was fortunate that I, I did. Uh, the weekend before, there was a, another tournament that um, that someone else uh, held. It's called the East Coast Snakehead Fishing Tournament. Uh, it's a series that uh, this guy, uh, Richie, has been putting together. Uh, and this is his first year putting it or holding it. So um, that was one where you can fish anywhere that's public waters. Uh, and so I used that as an opportunity to go fish the quiet to kind of figure out where the fish were. And that weekend it was ridiculous. The winds were like 20 to 30 miles per hour. And it was, it was cold as hell. Uh, it was like, like I think mid forties, like lower fifties. Um, and I fished out of a pretty tiny kayak, a little 10 foot uh, new canoe. And I, I pulled up to the spot and I was like, I'm not getting out. It was white capped like crazy. Um, so that Saturday I didn't fish, um, a tournament on, on Aquia, but that Sunday I was able to go out and, and find fish and figure out the conditions that, you know, where they were at. And, uh, yeah, I used that to my advantage the next weekend, um, knowing, you know, when they were biting, when they were active, kind of the situation uh, where I could find them. And it worked out because, uh, I heard there are folks in the same area that I was at, but once, you know, once the fish started hitting, there's nobody around. So I had this whole area to myself, uh, without anyone seeing what I was doing, wow. um, you know, seeing, you know, what was working for me, what wasn't. And, it, uh, yeah, it, was, it just worked out great. In the snakehead world, how rare is that to get places to yourself? Because I know bass fishing on the Potomac, you either are doing something really right or you're horrifically wrong. If you don't see another boat, um, is that normal? I honestly, I think it's still in its early stages of, of really understanding snakeheads and their their patterns. That you could be, you know, in an area without anyone around and still be pretty successful. Mm. Um, you know, bass fishing. Everyone knows the patterns throughout the years. You know, everybody has the same idea of patterns. And, and where to be, you know, fishing points or, you know, you know, fishing creek mouths or, or whatnot. Um, or snakehead, I mean, it, me personally, I have a formula that works for me, but somebody else might have something totally different and it works for them. But we just haven't, you know, um, had any meetings of the minds to really put it all together. And no one's really sharing, you know, their formulas yet. Um, I mean, some folks are. But I found, and I used to, I really did. Uh, I used to until, the, you know, I started tournament fishing. Then I realized, well, I can't be sharing all my information because sharing all my information, you know. Do you think that's because that it's so know. new? I do. I do think it's, it's because it's so new. And, you know, you know, folks have, I mean, folks just have certain ideas that, um, you know, I've seen, you know, years later, you know, people find out that it's not true, like, um, early on, people thought the snakehead uh, hibernated, quote unquote, in the uh, in the winter time. Um, they thought they dug into the mud and just sat there until you know the water warmed up. But I mean, once I heard people catching them, you know, in December, in January, and the conditions that they caught them, and I was like, oh, so they're active. They're just they're like that. They're slower. You really just got to slow down and you really got to figure out, you know, where they're at. Hmm. That's really cool. So, you know, getting back to your tournament day, then how did it start off? Was it slow? Did, were you able to get your first one on the board early? No, I had, I knew that because it was cold, you know, it's early, um, this was back in April. So it was cold in the morning um, and then, you know, warmed up in the afternoon. Uh, and in my experience, you know, pre-fishing, the bike didn't really turn on until afternoon. So, um, yeah, I, I had people comment that I checked in late because checking, you know, like I said, starts at 4.30. I didn't check in until 5.30. Uh, I didn't rush out on the water. I took my time getting to the areas that I wanted to get to because I knew the bike wasn't going to turn on. Um, but, you know, regardless, you know, once 6 o'clock came, I just fished it straight you know, in the full, you know, uh, eight hours or so. And I guess it's, yeah, nine hours. So 
I just continually fished the whole time, hoping that, hey, maybe I can get this early bite. But the early bite never turned on. And it wasn't until about, I'd say, 1 o'clock. Wow. Uh, until I got uh, first, you know, my first bit of action. And then I realized, okay, they're, you know, they're, they're picking up. And it's time That's to late. Really, <clears throat> yeah, really start and focus on it. How do you, and this is really cross species, whether it's, you know, bass or snakehead, crappie, I'm assuming. In tidal fisheries, yeah, sometimes it happens where it's like, yeah, the day feels like it sucks until 2 p.m. when the tide turns and all of a sudden you catch 50. <coughs> How did you mentally keep your head screwed on straight to be like, all right, well, today sucks so far, but it's going to turn around? Um, Just experience <laughs> of having those days that totally sucked, <laughs> you know, in the past, going out, you know, on, on your free days. And saying, you know, I'm, I'm going to put maybe five hours of fishing in. And then for four and a half hours, it just totally sucks. And then that last 30 minutes, you know, you just get turned on and you're like, oh, I've got to get off the water now. This is horrible. Um, but yeah, it's just, um, it's just something I've experienced, you know, over the years and it just doesn't deter me. Um, as long as I have an idea of, you know, what the pat, you know, what, what it's going to be looking like that day. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. That makes sense. Now, now if, you know, I were fishing, you know, if the conditions were the same and then there are 40 fish on the board by nine o'clock and nothing's happening for me, then I have an idea that I'm doing something wrong. Uh, but fortunately there weren't many, if any fish until about noon. Did was it a just the conditions got right or was it a change of spots that really did it for you? Uh, it was to me it was the conditions. Um, there were a few I had a few um, spots that worked for me in pre-fishing, so I kept visiting those few spots, and uh, I had an idea that it was going to turn on afternoon, and I got to one of my spots and nobody was around, and so I was like, okay, I'm just going to park here. Um, and that's kind of what did it for me. You know, no one else came back. Uh, cause I did see some folks, you know, way out in the distance, uh, wow. had been in that area, but they moved off. So I was like, okay, now's the time for me to get over there. Um, and it worked. That's crazy. That's awesome, dude. So when did you think you had it? Honestly, I did it. So it's a three fish tournament. I won with two fish, uh, and they're, they're good fish, uh, one was like a 30, I mean, they were both over 30 inches. Um, so I got two dragons that day, which isn't, you know, isn't common. Um, but easily, you know, so that's 60 some odd inches. And, but if somebody had three fish, you know, three 25 inch fish, you know, just average size fish, that would have, you know, beaten me. So I honestly wasn't sure that I, I had won. Um, that is like, whether it's crappie, bass, snakehead, doesn't matter. It's, I think, knowing when you're on the water, when the fishing is going to be gangbusters, and when it's going to suck. Because I've had tournaments that way, too, where it's like, this bag is terrible, I did my best, and then you find out everybody else sucked, too, and you're right there. And then you're like, crap, I should have actually just grinded for a couple more dinky bites because that's all I needed. And it's, is that what you're kind of feeling? Like, I got two good ones, but I really kind of, like, dropped it then? Uh... No, I mean, I did the best I could where I was at. I, l I actually lost the fish because I had a new net and I, ha I didn't have it fully extended oh, out. Uh, I wasn't ready. Yeah, it, it was one of those situations. So I was working it, working the net in its shortest position and I wasn't quite re ready for it. And so I lost the fish and I, it was, it was also a dragon. It was, it was at least 30 mm. inches. It was heavy. Um, and so that one broke my heart. I was, you know, and I was like, oh, no, this isn't going to happen again. So I got, you know, I slowed down, you know, made sure all my equipment was right. And then I went right back to it. Um, fortunately for me, like nature was helping me out that day. There were ospreys, um, you know, flying above. So when they're flying above, I could see pods of, of fish being scared off and moving around. Hmm. <clears throat> so I was hoping I was like, you know, I just. There were Hail Mary said, Hey, hopefully there's a snakehead. And, and they were, cause they're, you know, I figured that they were snakehead or carp, but being in the afternoon, I, I, I didn't think they were a carp. Why? 
to they just have it. Why did you think they weren't carp because it was the afternoon? Um, because what I noticed, you know, during those weeks of uh, pre fishing was that the carp are really active in the morning, um, you know, swashing around and stuff like that, um, really digging through the grass. And it, you know, sometime in the afternoon, it was like they took turns. They're like, you know, the, the snakehead would move in or start, you know, sloshing around and then you just didn't see as much carp movement. Um, the areas that I were fish, I was fishing, I mean, I was catching, uh, I was finding bedding bass. They were, they were sizable too. Like on the Potomac, I mean, 19 inch, 20 inch bass, you know, to me aren't that common. I mean, I, I mean, folks pull them out all day long, but, uh, that's awesome. Not me. So I caught, yeah, I caught a, quite a few of those during practice. And then, uh, yeah, then I found the snakehead as well. And you know, that's when I figured out, I was like, okay, the carp are going to be moving around in the morning. Um, and then once they're done, then hopefully after that, any, any movement is going to be snakehead. What category were you fishing with? Were you throwing treble hooks or just straight more like a jackhammer style, big hook, heavy braid, six pound test, crappie, like stuff like what what was your setup um so gear wise i use uh, a heavy rod um with a fast or extra fast tip oh, wow. um, but i was throwing uh, frogs that day uh, and so you know I have a few different frogs that i go through um some of them are more of a uh, a search bait uh, where they make noise and you know as you're moving them through the water they make noise um, others, of course, like popping frogs. If you got, if you have an idea of where they're at, you just need to soak for a little bit. I'll throw those out, um, and then walking frogs as well. You know, you need something quieter so you don't scare things off, but you need that movement. Um, so generally, I mean, for snakeheads uh, on the Potomac, I'm you know fishing mats, um, fishing spat, you know, spattered off lilies, stuff like that, I'm using frogs. Um, if I'm, you know, fishing like grass, grass edges, uh, or, you know, the edges of, you know, the, the mats, you know, I'm using, I prefer just the paddle tail on a Texas rig, um, you know, Texas rig style, uh, paddle tail. To me that I've caught more fish with those than I have with chatter bait, spinner bait, or anything like that. I've always been curious if, if pure snakehead anglers like yourself use those because I know as a bass fisherman how many snakehead I catch as bycatch, generally speaking, like with those baits. Um, is there a reason, generally speaking, those haven't caught on as well in the snakehead world? This is just my personal opinion. Um, I just think that snakehead are really smart. They'll, they, I've seen them hit when they're when they when they're interested in the bait, they'll look first before they actually just open their mouths and attack. Huh. Um, so you know, like I've caught, I have caught um, snakehead on buzz baits, but not as often as I do bass. Interesting. I, you know, with bass, they're just in my dumber. experience now. I'm not <laughs> passing. Yeah, not dumber, but they just they're more reactive. Um, you know, I've, I've had situations where I'm just burning a, you know, I throw, I have a bad cast with a chatterbait, so I'm just burning across the top of the water, and bass will just jump out at the movement without even considering what they're actually trying to eat. And, uh, you know, yeah. whereas I haven't had the same experience with snakeheads, they, they tend to just take a moment to see what they're, you know, about to hit before they actually hit it. I agree with that. I agree with that. That's interesting. How... Do snakehead, when they hit, do they just, like you said, they look at it first and then they slurp it in, or do they ram it ever with their mouth shut? Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've seen, I've had situations where I've had frogs just be continually popped up in the air. Um, not, I haven't experienced any, you know, ramming where they try and, you know, I guess. Maybe, kill it. Um, yeah, kill it or disorient the bait first, but. I've had a lot of situations where they do what I consider like a sword strike or, or just like a test strike. Hmm. Well, they just kind of like mouth it really quick, you know, to, to see, to me, it's to see if it's a lure, if it's an actual animal. Um, so, you know, in those cases, I'll, you know, just let them hold on to it for a little bit. And, you know, in the, in the situation where I have been able to, to 
visually see what's going on. I've seen them just have it in their mouth, swim around for a little bit, and then start chomping on it to swallow. That's so cool. So, yeah, and 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 you know, and it's those situations that kind of help me to you know to become a better angler. So I know it's not just the the one two count and then yank. It's hey, maybe maybe this time of year with what I've seen so far, maybe once they hit it, if I see the line moving, I give it a couple of twitches to make it seem like it's alive. Wait for them to really start pulling it, and then I yank it. Um, you know, it's it's. I think they're really smart fish. Oh um, God, yeah, you know, yeah. Folks might not, but I I really have uh, you know an appreciation for them, and, and just seeing what they do um, with the baits and stuff like that, rather than just straight inhale it from the get go. Uh, it's like they test it out. Yeah, they're very wary. They really are um, compared to like bass, smallmouth, or largemouth, smallmouth. One thing when I started to start dabbling in in the snakehead culture and talking to some people that weren't as big of an enthusiast as you are, I feel like a lot of people overdo it with tackle or underdo it. Um, when you're talking like braid and, and a heavy rod, are you talking medium heavy, heavy, or broomstick? Um. Well, I, I like to be able to have... so. What my rod is right now, or my favorite rods anyway, um, they're heavy with an extra fast tip. And um, so that way I can actually work a frog uh, and, and walk it if need be. Because otherwise, if you just have like a, a pitching rod, you know, broomstick style, all you can really do is just retrieve. Like you, it, to me, it's hard to work, you know, a, a lure with that type of, uh, with that type of rod. Um, unless, you know, you just throw in a jig and you're just popping it up and down, up and down. Um, now I, you know, I, I have fishing buddies that use extra, extra heavy rods. Um, that's just not me. Uh, you know, I have other buddies that use 50, 60 pound braid. That's also not me. I've been pretty successful with just with the 30 to 40 pound range. Um, to me, it helps. In my experience, I've, I've had it, you know, help to cut the spatter dog, help cut lilies, um, you know, so I, so I keep fishing the line. Um, and I really haven't had the experience of, of breaking off a lot. Uh, other folks have, but I've just been fortunate. That's awesome, dude. I mean, again, like awesome. Congratulations. You know, the winner of the first VKAE event um, of the year. I know there was, there was guys can little backlog. So this is a little late getting out, but uh, there was also a second event and I'll be getting the winner on there too. Um, but the one thing I also want to talk to you about, because I think this is a very cool niche too, that will grow on the Chesapeake Bay is the saltwater kayaking here because it's really big in South Carolina, North Carolina. And because we have so many inshore species now with the trout and the redfish, that's pretty cool. And I don't feel like a lot of people know about it. I, I, I think it depends on who you talk to. True. Um, True. Like the folks out in the Hampton roads areas, um, they, there's a big kayak fishing scene out there. Um, you know, one group is the, uh, trying to think it's tkaa title kayak anglers association i think it's called uh they they hold a lot of different tournaments and, it, and because of that area also has freshwater fish and saltwater fish uh they they do a bunch of different um events throughout the year but yeah i you know i first started fishing for you know kayak fishing for uh saltwater species probably in the Lynn Haven uh, inlet uh, we just uh, uh, an ascend 12 foot kayak and just straight Good paddling Lord, man. Uh, yeah man it was <laughs> not looking back now I'm like what the hell was I thinking <laughs> you know because I would fish I would fish that inlet and you'd hear horror stories about people you know and, and, and how dangerous it is but to me like I was just floating around on top and as long as you know how to paddle and know how to fish eddies and stuff like that and it didn't seem that bad to me at the time jeez dude but uh yeah i mean at the time we, we targeted you know the easy stuff like like croakers you know um croakers and pinfish and then um flounder and redfish and stuff like that um and then we just started branching out you know those are the most more common areas Lynn haven inlet rudy inlet 
Um, but then we started branching out. I mean, you, you've got, you know, the areas um, on the different necks of Virginia. So, you know, you've got the Potomac, the mouth of the Potomac, the mouth of the Rappahannock. Uh, you got Mojack Bay, um, you know, the Gloucester area. Like we started, like my buddies and I, we started, um, you know, just exploring, seeing what's, what's what in those areas. And it's just been a lot of fun. What is your favorite inshore species to target? It's, mm, I'd say uh, my most rewarding is probably sheep's head uh, because to me, I'm still learning like the bite, um, you know, to consistently figure out how to, how to soft, catch yeah. them. I mean, I've, I've had stellar days where you know, I've caught you know, my limit uh, and then I've had other days where I've just been robbed of, you know, you know, of, of all my bait. So, uh, they're, they're a very interesting fish to catch. Um, but otherwise I really love catching flounder, doormats. I mean, they're just oh, that's... a lot of fun. And they eat good too, man. And then re- oh yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, of course, drum. Um, they're, they're always a lot of fun too. A drum are fun. So pretty much because. Yeah. As soon as you catch them, I mean, as soon as you can get them on the hook, they're, they're just pure power. You know, it's not like any freshwater fish. They just pull your drag no matter how, how, how far you have it uh, cranked out. Do you think they fight longer than a snakehead would, generally speaking? It's a bit different because, uh, you know, I don't really catch snakehead <coughs> in like 30 feet of water. <laughs> so they don't have the opportunity to... To swim around as much, um, but yeah, good sized reds will just you know pull for a while, and uh, I don't know. The, the action is just so much fun. Just just sitting there holding on, just being like, "Oh gosh, it's still going," you know. All right. Well, before we end today, I, I got to have one salt. Do you have one saltwater story for us? I'm trying to think of. Uh, good story i guess uh so one of my favorite experiences on on the salt or in the salt water um i was fishing uh tip the peak state park um where the concrete ships are and you know this wasn't planned nobody had any idea these these fish were coming in but spanish max rolled in and so my buddies and i actually it was just one buddy at the time we were there were probably like six of us all throughout the concrete ships area um, but, uh, I just saw fish just jumping out of the water and I was like, what the heck is that? I was like, I couldn't tell if they're blues or what they were at the time. I, I assumed they were blues. And so, uh, and there was just one other guy that I fished with that was in the area you know, we saw each other. So we just started throwing, uh, baits out into there and there were Spanish max and they were just so much fun to catch. They were just, they would, if you didn't have thick leader on, they would just bite through your leader um, they, I went through pretty much all my spoons, um, uh, and then I started throwing plastic baits at the time. Uh, and, and it was just a lot of fun. And, um, I forget what the limit was, but it's a pretty hefty amount that you can take home. Uh, so I brought some home, uh, you know, shared it with the family and it was really good. Folks say that they don't like Spanish Max, but I threw them on the grill and they were just fantastic. Yeah, I never understood that. I don't mind mackerel. I really don't. Um, I think it's also how you season yeah, it. I'm not, you know? Yeah, I really, uh, I don't know. I really like the smoke flavor on them. Yeah. They turn out pretty good. Yeah, it, it, it's something that you can enhance the flavor by like grilling it. That is a huge thing versus like pan frying it, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's pretty much uh, my go to method, just grilling everything. Jonathan, I mean, I. Especially, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just saying, especially snakehead. Uh, if you ever have a chance to fillet them, you can throw the meat straight onto the grill. It, it doesn't fall. Apart. I was going to say, what is your best recipe, really, for snakehead? Um, I'm really simple. I mean, I'll just throw some, you know, just sprinkle some tahini on it, and then uh, throw it straight onto the grill, um, or just you know, salt and pepper with some butter, and it turns out great i mean if i if i'm feeling you know like i want to put in the work i'll fry them you know batter and fry them that's the way my kids like them um but generally i just 
fillet them and throw them straight on the yeah. grill. Fish, they're like, I don't know of another fish that is good for fish tacos like snakehead, honestly. That's pretty high up there for me. Agreed. <laughs> Dude, I, we've covered so much. Is there anyone that you'd like to give a shout out to or, or sponsors that you'd like to, to promote? Um, well, I'm not sponsored by anybody, but I, I would like to give a shout out to, you know, my fellow VKAE um, members, uh, the team, and then as well as uh, the Legion of Anglers. Uh, they're, they're based out of Maryland, but they're kind of a regional group. Um, they're also, they also hold, uh, Snakehead tournaments, single launch tournaments out of Maryland. Uh, so, you know, if you're in Maryland, give them, you know, check them out. Or if you're in Virginia, check out VKE. But it's not, you're not tied to either of them. You can fish both. That's the one nice thing about uh, kayak fishing, right? Yep. And as long as, you know, you just pay the, pay the travel fees and you're good to go. You don't have to pay $200 in gas like a regular boat. Yeah, that's... Yeah, that's one thing I'm learning right now with the kayak world is it's just so much more efficient. And, like, economy's not great. And when you have to put $200 worth of petrol in your boat, man, it it adds up real quick. It really does. Uh, yeah, it does. But that's a conversation for, for, for another day. Um, as always, guys, like, Jonathan, thank you. I, I, I really am happy that you were able to come on this show and, and really share some wisdom in the snakehead world. They got two VKE events down. Uh, I, of course, will put a link in the episode description to their website. Uh, I try to do as much as I can to really promote this really cool club for this niche fish. Like, subscribe to the channel, guys, and we'll see you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia, and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits Online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.